from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good afternoon. I'm Larry Applebaum from the Music Division. I'm here once again with Dr. Ingrid Monson, Quincy Jones Professor of African American Music at Harvard University. We had an interesting, stimulating chat the other day, and I kept thinking, there's more. There's more to talk about, more to discuss. So that's what we're going to try and do today. I want to get a sense, first of all, for what exactly the Quincy Jones Professor of African American Music at Harvard does. What do you do? Oh, I do. Yeah, tell us your typical day oh, at the my university. Day. Ah, well, it depends uh, uh, whether it's a teaching day, a meeting day, or a research day. Okay. But um, usually, when you know, teaching is very time intensive, and I spend a lot of time preparing for courses. Mm -hmm. um, continually trying to update my material. So there's a lot of preparation for the teaching of the courses. There are then faculty meetings in which we discuss the progress of students, deal with what our curriculum is going to be. There are departmental and university committees of various kinds. Now, I'm in two departments, so I actually have two faculty meetings. Which two departments? Music and African and African American Studies. And in African and African American Studies, I serve as the Director of Undergraduate Studies, which means that I have office hours every week where I'm meeting with people who are uh, majoring in African and African American Studies and try to help advise them on courses to take or how to meet the deadlines that they need to, to meet to um, complete their degree in a timely fashion, to turn their uh, senior thesis in on time, those general things. Um, faculty members spend time on search committees. So mm. in, in, in search committees, you read the dossiers of many, many very promising candidates. Uh, and then you have to discuss them and come, you know, and meet with your colleagues and talk about them. You uh, have to go to their interview uh, events, which include talks and teaching classes and lunches and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of stuff that we do that has nothing to do with, you know, what we ostensibly got our degrees for, which is doing research. So we're all, we're always constantly trying to um, find more time for research. Of all those things you just mentioned, what are the parts of your job you enjoy the most? Well, I like teaching. I love interacting with the students. And I love doing my research. So the, I would say I prior, prioritize those two things. Um, I think I am in the company of most of my colleagues when I would say that meetings are my least favorite. <laughs> because they're not always productive or because they're political or what? Well, they take up a lot of time and sometimes you feel like maybe the meeting wasn't necessary. Maybe this could have been handled in some other way. Did we really, you know, have to spend an hour in a meeting about this? Hmm. But this is a common complaint throughout universities. Indeed. So I want to get a sense for the trajectory of your career. How did you get from being a practicing musician mm -hmm. to becoming an educator scholar? Well, I was living in Boston, and I was playing in a number of different groups after I graduated from music school from New England Conservatory. You were a trumpet player? I was a trumpet player. Yeah. I played in the Klezmer Conservatory Band, which um, does klezmer music. And that band was quite successful. We toured uh, a number of places and were on Prairie Home Companion and that sort of thing. I also played in salsa bands in Boston. And I played in you know, pickup jazz gigs where we tr would organize them in various spaces and places in, in, in the Boston area. Uh, I also was doing a certain amount of teaching kids how to play the trumpet. Um, so there I was. And you get tired of touring. You get tired of traveling. You get tired of packing your bag 
Um, and, I, and I felt like I wanted to be doing more reading. So I had this thing where I often did my warm-ups where I was reading things. Hmm. You know, other people were watching TV while they did their warm-ups. Uh, but I was, uh, I was doing quite a lot of reading, and um, I learned about the field of ethnomusicology. I think my time at New England Conservatory exposed me some to world music because there was a man at the conservatory at that time named Dr. Peter Rowe, who was a sitarist, and I took a class in North Indian music from him. And it, and it was, it was mind-blowing, it was, it was amazing, and so he was, a practicing musician and taught us all, all sorts of things. Uh, the um, the bowls, the, the the verbal sounds that you make to speak rhythms in Indian music. Uh, I read Harry Powers for the first time, who is a, a, a musicologist at Princeton who wrote widely about Indian music. Uh, and so I was very very fascinated by Indian music, and that made me. Um, you know, open to ethnomusicology, as did playing in, in Latin bands uh, in the Boston area, because that, that opened up a whole world to me as well. Can you talk just a little bit about that world that's opened up? What, the? Yeah, how did it open up to you? How did playing in a, in a Latin band or a salsa okay, band? Okay, so I played in this band, Ruben Guiti y su orquestra, and um, it basically was a cover band doing covers of arrangements by people like Willie Colon or Celia Cruz or some Tito Puente. Um, and we play, and there were a mixture of things in the repertory. Um, there were straight up um, salsa pieces uh, for a more pu pu Puerto Rican kind of audience. Then we played cumbias for Colombians. We played merengues for Dominicans, so I started to learn about you know different musical Rhythms. styles associated with different subsectors of uh, the Spanish-speaking population in the Northeast. And we did gigs at Lawrence. We did gigs in Boston. There was a place called the Latin Paradise uh, in Providence, uh, in a social club in the Bronx. And I love playing the music. First of all, it's very trumpet-centric. Okay. Um, Secondly, the dancing that took place in these clubs was just amazing. And I found that as a person with a jazz background, I had to learn a different sense of time hmm. uh, to do this. And I started to learn about clave, uh, which is a subject that, ha that is very profound, that goes, that, that goes very deep. And I think at the time I was in those bands, I only understood that a little bit. So, so clave was, being sort of the heartbeat of rhythm for a lot of the Well, the, this idea that there's a syncopated rhythm, recurring rhythm, that around which everything else is organized. Hmm. And that there are elaborations of this pattern that everybody knows that are played on the cuscara drum or on the timbales, or what's being played on the cowbell um, at particular times. And um, so it was, you know, it piques your curiosity. It makes you want to learn more. So I was always the kind of person who wanted to learn more. Um, and I enjoyed seeing these, you know, communities of people gathering for this music. And it was a world I hadn't had any experience with before, but it left me with a, you know, uh, an open feeling to wanting to know more about them. Uh, same thing with Indian music. Um, there was, n of course, not as large of Indian community in um, Boston around the music, and I didn't really become a player of it, but I started going to Indian music concerts, including you know, people like Ali Akbar Khan, who um, I heard a number of times and, and just was blown away by. I mean, if you're interested in improvisation, it's just uh, the level um, of improvisation that goes on in North Indian music is truly astonishing. So I, I wanted to hear, you know, so I, I had eclectic tastes. I wanted, you know, I, I solely went by, did I like the music or not? Did it pique my interest enough to, to spend more time with it? So that's why ethnomusicology became a, um, a good place for me. So your interest is piqued in a certain style, a certain genre. How do you pursue knowledge or even just information about these styles when there's not 
basic reference materials necessarily. Right, and that was certainly the case in the early 1980s. Yeah. Um, there was not much written about um, Latin music. There was not uh, there was not that much world music available in record stores. I mean, you probably remember this yourself. There was this store in Boston um, that carried like the Folkways Smithsonian collections, Folkways collection of world music. Mm. And I used to go in and buy those albums. And it wasn't like now you can go online and hear a little bit of it before you buy it. I, you know, you would look at it if you liked the cover, uh, if you thought that the label was um, interesting or, or, or reputable, you would, you would buy it. So I would just cold buy all sorts of records. And that's how I learned about it, um, in the Times Square subway station in New York. I remember that. I remember that. There shop. was a Latin record store yeah. that everybody went yeah. to, and so every time I went to New York, I would go into the, that that um, record store and buy Latin records. And the guy who ran it was so knowledgeable. <laughs> I would so just say, "Oh, I'm interested in really great trace players, for example." Yes. Well, here and, and out he pulls them. He'd go in the back and he'd rummage through and he'd pull out six of them and. I would just buy them based on recommendation. Well, right, and there was a place like this in Boston. It was a, a, a record store in Mission, in Mission Hill, uh -huh. neighborhood, in the Mission Hill neighborhood of Boston, and that was a Latin record store, too. You, you couldn't buy that music at a mainstream record store, and there weren't things like Tower Records then. Um, the, uh, an evolution started to happen in the 1980s with the, with the establishment of Tower Records and the apparent starting of, of this genre that becomes called world music. Uh, you have people like Salif Keita emerging. Um, you have um, Baba Mall coming to New York. All the Afropop stuff. Uh, you, yes, you get the Afro, uh, a lot of Afropop stuff. But you also had the mysterious voices of the Bulgarian women, yeah. and I loved that album. <laughs> but how to account for something like that? It's just in the culture. For some reason, that caught on and sold tremendously well. And I could never figure out, like, where did people hear about this? It didn't get played on the radio, for example. Yes. It wouldn't necessarily be written up in the, in the mainstream press. So how do these things bubble up? Well, there, well, I think it depends on the context, but in the case of the, of the Eastern European stuff, for example, there was this Bulgarian brass band in New York that I found out about through my klezmer circles when I started graduate school at NYU in 1985. And all of those people had been do, you know, running around collecting records in the same way of Eastern European music, Bulgarian records, you know, traveling various places, Yugoslavia. Um, and coming back with these rare button accordion, you know, recordings and things. And so those community organizations in New York, when they heard that the mysterious voices of Bulgaria were coming to Lincoln Center, which I think they did, I think they played in Lincoln Center, um, they all turned out. Hmm. So in a, in a similar way, uh, when I played in the Klezmer band, I mean, this was not a super huge audience, but the people who were devoted to it, were seriously devoted to it, and, um, and it was moving to play to them. Were you always comfortable playing in different time signatures? For example, a lot of this ethnic music is based on things that is mother milk, mother's milk coming for, some, uh, for people who grew up in the culture. Oh, right. But for those of us who were sort of conditioned by march music or by standard uh, swing music; mm -hmm. those are different rhythms. They are different rhythms, and most of the um, most of the klezmer stuff was actually not in those multiple rhythms. But members of our band were deeply interested in the stuff that was. So we practiced doing things in seven and ten and eleven. I had a Bulgarian brass band record that had all those time signature, um, signatures in it, and you know you pra it, you know so it's it's Does the it come fun easy of the for challenge. You? Well, yes, I would practice, practice it, and I would get it. Uh -huh. And what, what's interesting to me right now is that among, you know, now many of the clave rhythms have become more central in jazz as well. So 
in the old days, you didn't necessarily have to know clave really well, like the difference between a wawanko and a son montuno or um, various things. But now people really do need to know that. And people have been doing clave rhythms in seven. You get somebody like Daphne's Prieto, for example, from Cuba. Um, and so a, a drummer friend of mine, Ralph Peterson, did, you know, did a, was doing, you know, does a, a clave thing in seven that he expects his band to be able to pl play to. So I think um, doing some of those more ambitious meters has sort of come into the consciousness. So you, you somehow morphed from being just a player. Uh, your curiosity leads you to academia? Well, I'd always been, you know, a scholarly sort, too. And you have to, the other axis of my upbringing is I went to high school in Madison, Wisconsin during the Vietnam War. Hmm. Madison was very much a, um, a hotbed of anti-war activism. So I met all those people. I, um, I actually had moved into my high school when I was a sophomore, and so everybody else had friends there from the time they were like in second grade, and I didn't have as many friends because <laughs> I had just moved in. Um, so I went down to State Street in Madison, and I read all the alternative papers and you know, bought music and listened to it, and then one of my high school teachers was very much involved in some community organizing organizations, and from then I started in Marxist study groups mm. of various kinds. So by the time I was a sophomore or junior, I was reading a lot of political stuff, stuff about the Vietnam War, um, uh, kind of, you know, what, you know, the Marx, reading about Marxism is really good training for social theory, actually, as it turns out, and I think one of the reasons I did very well as a graduate student as I had a background in that. I actually was an economics major at the University of Wisconsin. Um, and I took all these courses. I took George Mossy's his, history course. Of course, Harvey Goldberg was on leave when I wanted to take his course. But the, these are people who taught sort of progressive history courses. Um, and so that was the other side of my my background, and so I was always interested in reading deeply about society, hmm. and you know, and trying to see the relationship between music and society. And uh, jazz always had that, um, you know, front and center. Just when you were in Madison, was Richard Davis teaching there? Yes, and Richard Davis was an early mentor of mine. Yeah. Um, I think it was in my junior year there when he came and I played in ensembles. He's the bass player for those the bassist, who are watching. The bassist, a wonderful bassist, yeah. and I took his jazz history class, which he taught based on the Smithsonian collection of classic oh, really? jazz. Oh, Yeah, interesting. And I was in, in ensembles with him, and he was really nice to me, you know, and he was very encouraging to students. And there was also on faculty that I'm a woman named Joan Wildman, who was a pianist and had um, a very close relationship to some of the people in the art ensemble of Chicago. And so she was in, you know, had an avant-garde orientation. And between the two of them, I became part of a community of, of people playing music at the University of Wisconsin. So Roscoe Mitchell was there. Yeah. Roscoe Mitchell came. Um, th there were some other people that came as well. Yeah. So. I wonder how much of this music, and we're talking about jazz, but other styles as well, how much of it is still sort of oral tradition versus things that you learn from reading books or attending a conservatory? Well, that's, that's interesting. When I was coming up, and even though I went to a conservatory, at that time there weren't that many jazz pedagogical materials. What was available was fairly minimal. There were some David Baker books, there were, and so a lot of the training was not focused on these books. Mm -hmm. I had a course in the Lydian Chromatic Concept of Tonal Organization George from George Russell. Um, but really, 
the heart and soul of the music really comes in the oral training. And also at New England Conservatory was Rand Blake in the, the third stream department at the, that time. And they really emphasized learning things by ear. And I took a third stream ear training class that Hank Kisnetsky talked and taught. And, and that approach was you learned your intervals by um, learning songs that begin with those intervals. And Rand had this you know, whole series of Billie Holiday songs. And what we would do, we had little cassette tape recorders. And there would be a song assigned every week. And we had to sing it back onto our tape recorder until we had it in our head. And there's certain Billie Holiday songs I will never forget. As a result, like, no more. Um, you know, so I thought that was a wonderful way to do things. But then jazz, we always were transcribing things, too, to try to figure things out. Um, By the so, way, wh what can you learn from transcribing either a solo or a composition? What do you, what's that process teach you? There are a lot of things. First of all, by the process of translating the sounds into notation can be very challenging. Um, and one of the things, in order to transcribe it, you usually have to repeat it a lot. So one of the things about transcribing something is it forces you to listen to things at a level of closeness that you would not otherwise do. And once you've listened to a piece enough to transcribe it into notation, it's deeply in your head in a way that it would not have been if you didn't do that. Um, there are many schools of thought on, on this. Some people think that you know, just learn to play along with it. Rand always used to emphasize singing, learning to sing it before trying to play it on your instrument. And that, I think it comes out of a Tristano kind of idea about this. And I think it's actually very effective. Now, I find personally, if I just learn it by ear and I go back to it, and I don't play it or think about it for a year, and I come back, it's sort of like I have to do it again. Maybe other people, um, you know, it stays in longer, but I, I find that if I don't use it so, if I, it, so it's nice to have had it written down so I can relearn it. Now, there are certain aspects, especially of jazz performance or even of recordings, that embody sound. It's not just notes. That's right. And so, for example, you can transcribe the notes that Ben Webster plays, but how do you get to his sound, that breathiness, that, you know, it's like the sound of someone's voice. It tells you so much. Absolutely. And, and it does. And I think that brings up a really key point about the limitation of transcription, is that it gives you two parameters, rhythm and pitch. And there are a lot more parameters in um, the fullness of sound. So, but part of learning a piece by ear from a recording is to try to emulate the sound. So people, as a trumpet player, trying to emulate Miles Davis's sound, for example, or Lee Morgan's sound. Th these are things that people do try to do. And is this what you tried to do? Um, yeah. Well, was there somebody that was a model for you as a trumpet player? Well, no, I like a number of them, but um, you know, there are always there are a number of people who are high on my list. For example, Miles Davis is high on my list. Lee Morgan is. I love his sound. You know, yeah. just I mean, as um, the quality of sound on the instrument, I like that rich um, sound, dense sound that he gets. Um, I studied for a while with Woody Shaw, and I like his playing extremely much. I mean, it's really hard to do what Woody does, okay, you know, so. Do you mean harmonically or rhythmically, or? Well, all these incredible pentatonic patterns that he developed. I have, I still have these exercises of his that he gave me that I practice. Huh. Um, but the way he was able to phrase with them. See, I think, you know, the other thing, it's not so much the notes or even the quality of the sound, it's, a kind of sense of phrasing that you get, that you, where you try to emulate. Yeah, like I think that's absolutely key in Charlie Parker. I mean, I don't know if you've ever heard kids who are just reading Charlie Parker transcriptions compared to the ones who've, who've actually listened to the solos and are, are trying to get to the places where he swallows notes and accents notes and things that, which are really um, you know, key to sounding anything like him. 
I just wonder if we're going to get to the point, sort of a next level of being able to notate the more idiosyncratic aspects of music production, of, of sound production. You know, I don't know. I mean, this is a, a big debate, and you know, there have been debates about this in ethnomusicology. There's always this thing about what good is transcription and what for. And if you, ha if you sit down a class and you have 12 people transcribe the same thing, you're going to have subtle differences in all of them. And then people like Charles Seeger tried to do things like the melograph where you see this, these sound spectrums. And I look at that, and it, it's like I can't do anything with that. <laughs> you know, I, I can't translate a sound out of that. At least with notation, I can translate a sound, uh, get something that looks like a sound out of it. Um, there are people who are doing really interesting things about trying to visualize music. And I'm fascinated by this. There's this guy, I wish I could uh, remember his name right now. But he does these elaborate, he does it by making MIDI, you know, entering MIDI parts to everything like a Beethoven symphony. And there's a guy who does James Jamerson bass lines like this. Enter it, he's a bassist and he uses MIDI to ent enter all the notes. And then you can create an animation of it where it moves in time to the music. I've seen that, yeah. And you can have different colors and different walls of sound to try to, you know, there's one of these tries to uh, give, you know, make crunchy harmonic sounds in Chopin hmm. uh, visible through colors on that. Um, so I think we're always trying to come up with new ways to represent music, and I'm always trying to come up with new ways to pr present music to my students where they, they hear more than they started hearing. The other day, when you first came and we were looking through some of the treasures in the collection, I showed you a piece by Wadada Leo Smith. Yes. A as an example of sort of non-traditional notation. Yes. And he is a great example of somebody who's trying to break through sort of old models yes. and, mm -hmm. and teach in a way that goes like straight to the heart or sometimes it bypasses the brain. Mm -hmm. Anthony Braxton's another one who makes use of non-traditional notation. Yeah. And both of them are very intellectually engaged in their own way. I mean, for, I've you know, had the pleasure of talking with Wadada Leo, Leo Smith and seen him do a presentation on the Ankrasmation. And he, it's a system. It's a very clearly, deeply thought out way of representing these things, and he, he uses it productively in his own art. And Anthony Braxton, the same, all those uh, numbers and circles and things as titles of the pieces, he was very much uh, very interested in signs, a very brainy guy. Um, so, you know, I think there's a tradition of people trying to um, find new ways of representing. Thank goodness. Um, so all of this was sort of background and context for you telling me or explaining to me how you get from being a player to becoming the teacher. And f I'll, I'll preface this part by asking, what do you think makes a good teacher? Um, a thing that makes a good teacher is getting to know your students hmm. and hearing them, listening to them. You may end up arguing with them about certain things, but, but that if you don't know your students, you're not going to be very effective at reaching them. And this is why teaching in a small group or a small is the ideal situation. Um, it gets harder, the, the larger the class gets, the harder it is to get that same feeling of uh, back and forth and exchange and really knowing all the students that you're talking to. Then, so do you teach undergrad and grad? I do, yes. And the undergrad classes, I assume, are larger? No, not all of them. Some of them are small. Uh, they're, they're different sizes, but there are courses in, at Harvard and things that they call general education that tend to be larger courses. And they've, I've tried to teach a couple of those for one, one, I started an R&B to Neo Soul class. It started out with 17 people, and then when it got, all of a sudden I had 150 in it, 
when it got approved for general education. And those courses are often ones where we have section leaders and that employ our graduate students. So I try to have a mixture of the larger ones and the smaller ones. And um, even though I prefer teaching smaller classes, I felt like I should teach the larger class because the graduate stu students need to have some experience um, teaching, teaching as well. Now, do you teach those same classes year after year? About every other year. I, 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 do, I, I do one large lecture course a year. And how does it change from year to year? Oh, I, it changes every time. Um, you know, I do a course called Jazz, Freedom, and Culture. And I have noticed a difference in the knowledge that people have coming into a course. Hmm. Um, the old expectation in a jazz course is to teach the, you know, the full history of jazz. Um, I have wanted to have more recent jazz in it. You know, I, I, you know, I've, lately I've given some thought of doing it backwards or doing it in dialogue or where I start with something really recent before I jump back to New Orleans and talk about where it, where it came from. Because it's hard to get our, our current undergraduate students to really get into listening to scratchy 78s. That's, um, they, they keep wanting the later, they keep wanting Miles Davis and Coltrane. Um, it used to be that a lot of people really loved hearing the avant-garde section of the course, too. Now that's a tougher sell. Um, so I've been trying to juxtapose some noise in hip-hop with noise from 60s avant-garde stuff to, to show them the relationship to it so they just don't think, well, that's, that's old stuff and why did people do that in the first place? Um, you know, I think of the, the younger generation as being adventurous or of thinking of themselves as being adventurous. But then I put on um, Sun Ra's, <laughs> space is the place, and they don't know what to do with it, you know, going to bed first. You know, so what how, is this about? How yeah. do they process this, or are they looking to you to provide? Well, I try to give them some process. I have them, you know, read materials. I, I, like John Zwed's book is absolutely wonderful on Sun Ra, so I assign the reading for that. But usually be, they haven't read it before, you know, they get to the class on Sun Ra and I'm playing, you know, materials from it. And I, so I just try to um, give them, you know, some understanding about where he was coming from and why he managed to create his own world uh, in a world that was not necessarily uh, welcoming to what he was about, and he did an amazing job of it, actually. What are the kind of um, required, what's, it, what's the required reading list for your classes? Um, what kind it depends, of authors? It depends on the course, but I always have Amiri Baraka Blues people. because. Standard. It, you know, it's, it's a really brilliant book, and it has an ambitious, it's social theory. I mean, I, I have a piece that I never published, but I, I, I put up online called Amiri Baraka as a social theorist, and he really had this idea of the path from slavery to citizenship and the way African Americans are feeling in the world can be followed through music, and he, drew on, he read Herskovitz, he read all sorts of anthropology in it, and so he's constantly trying to look at the relationship of African Americans to the music, but also in blues people of white people's relationship to it. So he talks about Bix Beiderbecke in there. He talks about white beboppers as um, being as, as marginal as African American beboppers, but it was a matter of choice. Kind of, that's kind of how we put it. So that's, I have them read Ralph Ellison. I have them read Albert Murray. I have them read um, books by any one of a number of jazz scholars, from Scott DeVoe to Gunther Schuller to, um, you know, Robin Kelly's biography of Thelonious Monk. Uh, I also have them read articles from journals at the time. They love actually reading the uh, articles from Downbeat or, during the Civil Rights era. Um, so the 
you know, big debates that were published in Downbeat magazine, uh, articles by Nat Hentoff. Um, you know, they enjoy, at one point when Nat was still with us, um, I had Nat come to a class that we did on uh, Freedom Now Suite, and we re read the debate, and he read the article, and then he was there, and the students were able to ask him questions, and they loved that. So if people, if anyone were to make a Freedom Now Suite for today, what would it sound like? Well, I think we're beginning to see some of what those sounds are in response to Black Lives Matter. Um, I've seen it in the last two or three years. I noticed a difference in the attitude of my class when um, I taught the class last spring. It's now that there is a movement on the ground, there is a sense of the younger people of what, what is their relationship to it going to be. One of the albums that I th think is interesting that, that has come out is Terrence Blanchard's Breathless. I don't know if you've listened to that. I have. Um, in which he's got some spoken word things going on in the piece Breathless. Uh, the poet, I, th I think the, the, the title track I think is really, really very, very interesting. And he's playing his beautiful trumpet solos with a band that is uh, kind of playing more elaborate versions of some popular music grooves, but you know, are, are ab absolutely jazz. He's, he's uh, used a Cornell West speech on that. And he's trying to, in Breathless, he's trying to talk about Eric Garner. So that's one example. So I think different musicians, as, as things hit them, are going to inspire new ways. Now I was very interested in um, Kendrick Lamar's album. To Pimp a Butterfly. Yes. Yeah. And what I noticed there, I've been interested in the jazz people that are trying to have some relationship to the hip hop world, people like Glasper. But in this case, it sounded like a hip hopper trying to have a relationship to a certain kind of jazz sound. And what I was interested in, in is that there were p p uh, parts of that sort of avant-garde saxophone sound. Kamasi Washington is, is yes, one of them. Yeah. Yes, yes, exactly. I'm, I'm not sure Kamasi is actually on that album. I think somebody else is on that album, but I could be wrong. But anyway, there is this sense that there is this sound, there's an assertiveness to the sound, and it has some kind of relationship to the message that Kendrick Lamar is trying to put out. And so it's putting that sound world into um, hip-hop, this, this artful, you know, in the upping the, the, the sense of artfulness in um, hip hop, not that it hasn't always been there. Um, and I think we'll see artists coming to different kind of collaborations along those lines. And so Robert Glasper and his stuff uh, uh, with amazing singers, um, Erica Badu. Um, and others, there is this kind of dialogue between the two. And then what, what, and then I was absolutely blown away by Beyonce's Lemonade. Now I wouldn't quite say it was putting jazz into it, but there was a level of artistic ambition in it that seemed to me really informed by understanding African American history and particularly women's voices within that that's drawing on, you know, there's, there has been this fluorescence in African American studies since I entered the academy in the 80s. Uh, these rich sources of history. Um, writers like Toni Morrison and examples like Toni Morrison or Audre Lorde and things that, are pe that people are studying in, in deep ways and that you see then inspiring a younger generation of musicians. So, it's going to be interesting in the next year when we start getting um, some artworks that, are, that will be speaking to the election of Trump. I would imagine so. I think they're going to blow our minds. Well, I mean, I guess this brings another question to mind. Um, many creative artists have always had their ear to the ground of what's happening yeah. in the culture. Yeah? 
And yet, when music is often inspired by popular culture, it can reach more people because of, of the message, but it doesn't seem to last as long. It has a, a shorter shelf life, mm -hmm. whereas certain, of what, uh, certain items that we would consider classics in jazz are relevant for a much longer period. And I wonder whether things that um, seize upon what's happening at the moment, is it just music of the moment? Or is, does this become a classic expression? Well, I think in a lot of these things, they become classic. I think a lot of the popular music stuff became, I mean, Marvin Gaye's What's Going On became classic. Curtis Mayfield. Um, that I do think a certain number of those works uh, in popular music do become classics. Um, and we're not sure what are going to become classics from what's coming out at this moment, and we don't, we're not sure what will become classics coming out of the, at this moment in jazz either. Well, uh, a fascinating example of that for me is, uh, I'd say in the 1960s, certainly late 60s into the early 70s, a lot of jazz musicians who wanted to um, attract a larger audience or more popular audience would adopt certain rhythms and certain sounds Mm -hmm. Especially if you look at um, Blue Note Records under the Mizell brothers, mm -hmm. right? And that stuff did become popular in its day and then for a long period of time was dormant and then it got rediscovered by people who started sampling. Sampling it, absolutely. Yeah. Cantaloupe Island for one, yeah. So it's, it's not always easy to predict these things, but it's fascinating how certain uh, modes of expression are cyclical. Mm -hmm. And they have a life beyond a generation. Absolutely. You can actually I skip a generation. Do. Yeah. So, um, what do you ha I want you to talk a little bit more about your students. And I mean, you've been at this for a while. You've been teaching how long? Since 1991. Okay. More than a minute. And <laughs> so, how have your students changed? Well, first of all, when I started, I was closer to their age, huh. okay. Um, and I felt like my own understanding of things in the world and theirs were not very different. Okay. And so I could talk about jazz or popular music or world musics in ways um, you know, that I, that I felt were easier to communicate. Now, over the years, then you become stuck in this role of you're the teacher and, and you have to grade them. You have to give them assignments, you have to, you know, so you start to become a certain kind of disciplinarian, whether you want to or not, because the nature of the university is such as that you have to grade them, and unless you're teaching at a school that, um, it doesn't have grades, in which case then you have to write lots of letters of, rec you know, basic, you have to write lots of letters about them. Um, the students, when I started teaching, were more aware of the real history of the civil rights movement, I would say. Um, it was in the experience of their parents, um, it, rather than their grandparents. Um, and they were open-minded towards a, you know, wanting to tear down racism view of, um, of teaching jazz. And white students, black students, they were open to, the, they were open to that narrative. Um, I learned in the first five years that there would be a certain group of white students in the class who would be resistant to wanting to think that anything about race or African American history mattered to the class. Why do we have to read all this stuff? Hmm. Uh, can't we just listen to the music? Can, you know, and they were more comfortable in a space of wanting to turn it into a technical problem. And I always felt, you know, in, in many cases, when I taught in St. Louis, for example, there would be very few African American students in the class. And the poor students who were there always felt, you know, sort of 
you know, put on the spot of ha having to speak um, for the entire culture. And some of them enjoyed doing that, and others just, you know, found it, found it depressing. Um, I did get a reputation as of being a sympathetic teacher. <laughs> so I, the more I was there, the more African American students came to my class. And once, I, and I really learned that once there was a critical mass of diversity in the classroom, you had a much more interesting conversation. And it was also very educational for the students to find themselves in a situation where there was more than a critical mass. Now, when I came to Harvard, Harvard had a bigger critical mass. So really, the last time I taught my R&B class, about at least 40% uh, of the class was African American. Maybe about 40% was white. And the rest was African American and Hispanic. So there was a real diverse group of people. So I really tried to teach it in a way that the African Americans felt like their side of the story was going to be the predominant one, and the um, white students had to deal with it. And many of them d do and rise to the occasion, and they're a self-selecting group of the white students. If, if you don't, you know, I, I teach it as an African American studies class, so um, they know that they're going to have to deal with race when they come to the class, so it's a self-selecting group of people who want to do that. But I really try to get them to engage with one another and to have the teaching sections have some honest conversations about these issues. Now, in some cases, there are flare-ups on various things that the TFs handle. For example? There, um, what's come up in terms of hip-hop is that the African American students really really don't want to see the white kids singing along to songs with the N word in them, and many of the white students were going, "I'm just singing along to the song. It's on the you know." You know so, so having a debate about that, for example, um, and that that's something that's changed since you know no. Uh, uh, the, the prevalence of that word in some hip hop has created a, a different discussion around this. Um, I would manage feelings of students who would say, well, you're talking about all this African American history, you're excluding the white musicians. Okay, so this becomes then a conversation about Let's examine exclusion here for a minute and who, is, who experiences exclusion in this society and um, what that's about. And, you know, it's not like I don't teach about any white musicians, you know, it, but that I try to put it in the context of this in the very racially unequal uh, structure of the music industry in the early 20th century. So, you know, trying to talk about Benny Goodman in a way that says that, look, in, by the standards of his time, he was a progressive. Um, by a, but a later generation would look back and say, well, this is an example of white appropriation. He took Fletcher Henderson's arrangement and he became a rich person on the air and the black bands couldn't get the sponsored radio. So I, I try to get them to have a more complex view. I don't want them to just say, okay, Benny Goodman is just an exploiter. I want them to see the dynamic about what gave him white privilege in that situation. And um, so why it's natural that some other people um, were resentful of that. Do you ever get kind of negative feedback about a white woman teaching about African-American culture. Oh, yeah, yeah. You That's still get okay. that. Well, the, it, comes with the, it comes with the territory. And I think any white person who's working with this is, you just have to expect that, that there's going to be some ambivalence. And that's OK. And I've had, you know, at, at the same time I've had that, I've also had wonderful experiences of people really warmly responding to me, African-American scholars and students and things that I wouldn't give up for, for anything, mm. um, and sometimes that I've been surprised by. So 
there, there are both sides of things. I think, you know, it matters, your attitude matters, an attitude of respect matters, an attitude of knowing what you're talking about helps. Even so, you know, I try to say to my students, I'm not trying to tell you to think just like I do about this. This is why I think about the, you know, here's why I think what I think. Um, it may look different to your generation. You need to have these conversations among yourselves about this. At the same time, you know, sometimes I feel very white standing up there going, here I am, going, going on about um, uh, issues of race, music, and culture again. Um, and I, I try to tell myself, and I, I think the good part of this is I often tell my students, you know, that one of the things I've always been interested in, in exploring is, like, what would an ethical relationship to African American music and culture be? I'm not saying I'm it, but I'm saying that I would like to be more like that. Okay, so, um, so I think being honest about that as a white person you have privilege you know, and being aware of that and, you know, mentioning all the content, you know, every, you know, every, you know, so I, so one thing I've said to the students, everybody, you know, how come everybody wants to, access to the good parts of African American culture, the fun parts, they want access to the music and they say you won't let me, you know, and so the latest trip on African American musicians, oh, you're excluding me, excluding me, nobody, at, nobody wants the privilege to be profiled on the, on the New Jersey Turnpike. Nobody wants the privilege of uh, having lousy schools in their neighborhood, you know. Um, so I try to get the, the non-African Americans to think about if you really want to appreciate, it's not just about appreciating uh, the music, it's about appre appreciating the people and the culture. So as you encourage your students to have their own conversations and to work with these concepts. Are you ever surprised by the, their insights? Do they come up with new things each year? Yes, they do. I mean, and, and I could write a whole thing about, especially in the smaller courses I teach where I get to read all their papers. Some of the students write amazing things. I mean, are you surprised by what they come up with? Um, I'm having trouble thinking of, of you know, one single uh, example that, uh, that can show you, but one of my, I had a student when I first came to Harvard, and he's now in our faculty, his name is Brandon Terry, he's a political scientist, and I taught my jazz class, and I think it was the one where Nat Hentoff came, and he wrote the most amazing paper. Of course, this is about 12 years ago, so I can't tell you exactly what the paper was about. It was extremely well written. Then I, had, I, then I taught another class where we did Motown, and um, Motown had the manners lady, Mrs. Oh, the one who taught all the groups how to behave. In yes, public, yeah. you know, and she taught Marvin Gaye not to close his eyes while he sang, you know, well, he traced her down in Detroit and did a phone interview with him. You know, great, with great. her about it. So um, there was also Charlie Atkins. Who Charlie used to Atkins, the teach dancer. Teach them choreography. Yeah, that was cool stuff. You know, and then so the students sometimes would have the idea that Motown, okay, they were just trying to act white, and I, I, I've always thought that's kind of unfair. Okay, given what you know, they were. This was the. Um, a really successful business, and yes, they systematic, they strategically try to do it so it would so it would make it into the mainstream, and it, brilliantly it did. The sound of young America and the Funk Brothers and James Jamerson. There's, you know, that's that's not a compromise with you know, musical sound. Um, But you, you, you mentioned. You know, but the students do. You know, they, they ask questions that you don't expect, and you respond to it. And sometimes it can be fun doing it. And when you're on, it's really fun. Some days you're not on. Do you like to be challenged as a professor? Yes, yes it depends on the kind of challenge. Respectful. 
Well, yeah, it has, if, if I feel like I'm being insulted, huh. then, then it's a drag. But I, 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 I won't lash out at them no matter how insulting they are. Do they try and bait you? Um, not often. Not often. Now, what, it, most of them are usually pretty respectful. Hmm. But if I say something they disagree with, then I try to deal with it and listen to them. And I may or may not agree with their point of view. I may, may, may think they're being unfair. Um, if I feel like the reaction, what I'm getting is sexist, I get a little icy. I, I would imagine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So. this is not surprising. <laughs> yeah. So do you think your students or students at Harvard are typical of students everywhere? I mean, are students students? In many ways, I do think students are students. Um, you know, we do have some extraordinary, extraordinary undergraduates at Harvard that can completely blow your mind. And then there are others who are, you know, no matter how smart they are, they're still kids. They're still 18, 19, 20 years old, and they have all the potential in the world, but they don't know all that much yet. But I also found that I had wonderful students when I taught at Washington University in St. Louis, when I taught at the University of Michigan, when I taught at the University of Chicago. Okay, so I haven't taught at any school that was a, you know, um, you know, all those schools are good schools. Um, but I do think that students can get overly obsessed about what going to a particular school means about them. Because there's plenty of students at the University of Wisconsin, for example, who are as good as any Harvard student. You know, and there have been studies about this. Um, uh, there's an economist at Stanford who did work on um, Carolyn, what's her, something with an H, who did a systematic study of what people's SATs were in all kinds of public schools, Chicago, Detroit, you know, you know the, whole, the whole country. And the interesting thing was that many of the working class and inner city neighborhoods, there were plenty of kids that had scores that would be competitive for getting into a top school, but not as many of those students applied to those schools. So I think that there are plenty of students across the country and I think an earlier generation of African American students, and I think like about somebody like Anthony Braxton or uh, people who were in the AACM, they went to like Roosevelt University in Chicago or Governor State University, um, let you know, uh, less prestigious schools, but they they got themselves very educated. So I'm, I'm against the snobbery about the schools. And the problem with Harvard is, I shouldn't say, uh, I shouldn't say this on camera. <laughs> well, it, it's, they get a little over, over invested in their brand. Hmm. But I'm the ben I have to say I'm the beneficiary of that, so I can't complain too much. They pay, they make my life possible. Um, you use the word, did you use the word snobbery? Was, was that something you just mentioned? Anyway, <laughs> I'm, I'm curious if you think there's an intelligentsia in jazz. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Jazz is an intelligentsia in some ways. But who, who are they, actually, and what do they do? <laughs> okay. Well, I think, you know. Are they just gatekeepers, or no? Well, I don't know. It's interesting. I mean, um, they're. Jazz has always had the self-confidence to sort of understand that it's important um, and that in order to become the musicians that musicians became, they had to be, you know, they had to work really hard and they had to learn a lot of things and they became interested in trying to be artists. I mean, the, the, the path of getting jazz recognized as an art was a, was a movement in many ways. Um, if Does you, this really start with bebop, or were people well, self-aware? No, it's it's even happening before. before that. You you know, Armstrong and Ellington are no slouches along these lines. No, I'm just either. talking about yeah. the awareness, the uh, self-awareness, um, not only as artists. It becomes more pr more pronounced after bebop, but okay. I you know I think someone you know someone like Coleman Hawkins or um, 
it, it evolved with the time of it. So, so there's an insider quality of talk among j the jazz community, however you define it. And I think of the jazz community as being comprised of musicians, of people who run clubs, of um, critics, of presenters, um, and audience you know, members who are, are, are devoted and they come. I always used to marvel when I lived in New York and when I was in graduate school that you would go to Bradley's or any one of the clubs and the same people were at these concerts um, or jazz at, you know, uh, this was before jazz at Lincoln Center. This was, um, you know, um, you know, even the, the concerts that would happen at Carnegie Hall or, um, you would see the same people there, and you would see the critics there. And I remember going to, you know, for example, I remember going to an Ornette concert at Carnegie Hall, and the first half was um, a Japanese singer who Ornette was promoting in some kind of way and trying to give a chance. Well, let's just say that the New York jazz audience wasn't responding that well. Everybody sort of left and went to the bar, <laughs> came back, came back. Um, but you would see those you would see those same people. So within this very large multi-million city, there was a small town feeling about um, the people who came out to the, to the jazz concerts. And I think we've always really liked that. But it is kind of insular, um, and other people think we're snobs, you know, or, or there is such thing as a jazz snob that. You know, there's this certain kind of person you're talking to, a record collector, and, and unless, you know, so I have Mingus's, Charles Mingus presents Charles Mingus, and the other one has, well, I have a, you know, and a recitation of record numbers and, and everything. And usually we're just being excited about what we're doing, but there is a little ranking thing that, sure. that goes on. The Matrix Boys. The, yes, the, the Matrix Numbers Boys. And I always felt like, and there, then sometimes there was a certain kind of male conversation that would go on that no matter how much I tried to, to insert myself in the conversation, they were talking to each other. And, uh, well, and isn't, I was isn't collecting a male impulse, or am I being sexist? Well, if you talk to Kryn Gabbard, he will say, you that it, say that it, uh, that is a male impulse. Sherry Tucker is a collector. Uh -huh. And so Sherry would argue with Kryn that, um, no, there was nothing in your DNA that made you a coach. It's just what when you, you go to certain communities, if you circulate, yes, that you'll jazz, see that some guys. are predominantly yes. male and some are not. So, And, and even within um, the jazz community at large, there are sub-communities based on different genre. So oh, yes. it's, it's not as if... A, somebody who likes jazz likes all different kinds of jazz. That's right. Now, I'm, I'm the kind that likes all different kinds of jazz. I sort of feel like as a, being a scholar makes you want to advocate for all of that. Huh. And I want to see the whole of the music represented. When you're an artist, I think, though, you cultivate developing your own voice, and you want to advocate for that, for that place within it. So if you are... A, a successful experimental musician, you're going to argue for that, and you're kind of go, going to look down on your nose at somebody who does something else, or at least that's been my experience. So I'm guessing you, like like many people in this country, are paying attention to what's happening politically, among other ways mm -hmm. to think about it. And we know that there's been some discussion floating about around the possible um, pulling of funding for the National Endowment for the Arts, the National Endowment for the Humanities, and other agencies, especially agencies that work with culture. And I wonder what, how important is government support for the arts, and to what extent do, do, do the arts really matter in people's lives? Well, I think the arts are extremely important. This will not surprise you. And I'm horrified at the idea of the NEA and the NEH being defunded. Um, first of all, it's a relatively small amount of the federal budget already. And I think what people don't realize is that the various grants and programs that are sponsored by the NEH are really, really important 
in a number of ways. I think to presenting agencies where they, you know, just getting part of their funding from the NEA makes them more credible to fundraising from other kinds of foundations and organizations to put together a program. Um, we need to care. When you look at Europe, they have high, entire ministries of culture and things that are about supporting their cultural efforts. The NEH, I mean, humanities scholars are always applying for those, those grants. They're very competitive grants. They, they have an extremely good track record of producing excellent scholarship. They have a wonderful digital humanities initiative as part of it, and we need these things. Um, you know, overall, with the change in the, po the politics, the thing that is most discouraging to me is the deep anti-intellectualism, the deep anti-knowledge of this, the fact that um, people don't seem to care about the truth. Uh, they just care about manipulating discourse to get what they want is what, what seems to be is happening uh, these days, and I think that is Horrifying. What we try to do in scholarship is um, present ideas and cite your sources where you got them. That um, you know, be able to show where you are got your facts from, so that somebody else can come and take a look at it and re revisit it and see it in a different way if they, if if they so believe. And I, I think those kind of research skills are really important for, um, for students. So I feel it's, you know, it's not only the NEA and the NEH that under attack, but all of higher education. I think there, there has been, so, as, as if to be educated and um, know things is simply a East Coast snobbery or something, or, no, or liberal sno snobbery. Or elitism or elitism, and the thing is, I don't like elitism of a, well, when I say elitism, I think that when somebody's just being arbitrarily um, um, hierarchical, um, and I don't think that's what real scholarship is. I think what, what scholarship is, is learning deeply about something and be able to um, present and defend your position and that's part of being an educated person in the world. That's part of what we need in all forms of leadership. So when I hear we have a president that doesn't read and w instead watches TV, that really disturbs me. How can we get informed, smart policy such that has, has always you know, been uh, happening within the federal government, you know, I mean, at, at its best? So, the idea that reading and writing or the arts aren't important, you know, is, is um, deeply, dis uh, deeply disturbing to me. And I think the presidents of universities are trying to speak out at our own uh, university. Our own president is very supportive of the arts. We don't, don't always have enough money to do things. Um, but I feel like uh, President Faust gets that. Good. Um, I want to address something. I, I think we have a little bit of time left. Um, you're going to give your talk, your lecture on Thursday night. What will the topic be? It's called um, Miles and Train as Living Ancestors. And it's part of their 90th birthday. And it's, the talk is really my attempt to try to talk about them in a way that tries to bring something new to the table. Now, it's very difficult to say anything new about Miles Davis and um, John Coltrane, and so I try to contextualize them. Um, what does that mean, by the way, to contextualize them? Oh, that's one of those academic words. Oh, um, to, sorry. To um, fill in the historical context to put it within a framework, and what I'm doing is I'm talking about them as being like um, living ancestors in African religions, which are examples of divinities, but divinities with individual personalities 
divinities with flawed, just like the Greek gods are, you know, or Hindu gods are that way. And to really try to get at what it feels, feels like to listen to Miles and Coltrane and, and why we lose our um, critical distance when we're in the act of listening to this. Hmm. <laughs> 35 years ago, I interviewed Archie Shepp and yes. I asked him at the time, one of my yeah. more naive questions, what do you think Coltrane, you know, what do you think about him now? What, uh, what would have happened to him if he had lived beyond his mm -hmm. 40s? And he said, John Coltrane would be an old man standing by the side of the road with a stick in his hand. That elder. Yes, yeah. exactly, absolutely. Well, I have some fun tidbits in there. Yeah. That, um, and I kind of contrast the two personalities because they were, they were very different personalities, both absolutely pivotal to the music and um, inspiring deep devotion by many different kinds of people. How much of that devotion is based in mythology versus reality? Not that these are mutually exclusive. Well, they're, they're both there. Um, people's investment in the mythology part, I really feel is deeply related to their listening experience of it. Okay, huh. So I've got some examples in this lecture, for example, of Amiri Baraka responding to listening to Miles. And, and an essay he wrote about after Miles died. Um, I have materials of showing different people, viewing them as models of different things. Hmm. Um, and, you know, look, I'm a scholar. I wanna, a part of being a scholar is, is breaking down mythologies. But I think you have to look at both where they come from and, 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 and look at people's investment in them um, as part of how they are as fans in this. But people want to believe what they want to believe. That's true, they do. And they don't want to be um, distracted by nuance necessarily or by the things that are, don't celebrate them as much. You know, because everybody's human. Right, exactly. We'd much rather have a positive story about ourselves. So I, I understand that. And, the, and you walk a line when you're trying to write about some of these famous people of if you break down their mythology, are you hurting them? And I took the position in my um, Freedom Sounds book that You've got to have that nuance in there that if, if it's just all celebratory, you lose the story of how hard it wa was for them to become who they were. Uh, and I think I mentioned this the other day, but I really view music as a, a, a means of self-making and that the, the towering figures in this were, did, an, did an amazing job of that. And, it, and that's one of the reasons they're so admired. Is there also a risk at romanticizing the struggle? Yes, of course you can romantic you can yes, you can you can romanticize it and you know and never be critical of the person. Um, I don't believe in that either. Hmm. So it, you have to have a balance. Um, look, nobody's perfect. That's my <laughs> No, everybody struggles and that's yes, what okay, nobody's helps us perfect connect. and everybody has things they've done that they're ashamed of and um, that's true for great artists, just as it is for everybody else. So, uh, you'll forgive me, but I, I, I'm thinking about Miles right now, and, and Coltrane for that matter. And people tend to, I mean, part of what makes Miles such a contemporary figure still, and it's not just this movie that came out last year, it has less to do with his music and more to do with who he was in the culture and what he represented. And so I wonder which aspects draw you in. What are you most taken with 
when it comes to somebody like Miles Davis? Well, someone like Miles. Well, is, it, is it the music itself or? Well, it's music for me. Um, you know, he had, you know, and I'll talk about this on Thursday, he had this more rebellious, trickster type quality to his persona. He always dressed really well and thought about it. He looked cool and everything. And, and Baraka has this piece where he's just going rapturous over, you know, how Miles Davis looks on it. You know, and so I think for men, you know, there, it was a certain kind of model of a kind of a modern um, African American cool hip jazz guy um, who wasn't going to bow down, and so modeled a kind of resistance to what was expected of him that that was widely admired, and women admired it too. Um, the underside of Miles, of course, is he was he was really awful to the women he was involved with. Um, and that's the, uh, you know, that's an underside of, of the story. And he could be mean and mercurial um, and generous one moment. I mean, Her Her Herbie Hancock writes about him in his autobiography and very interesting. He talked about how generous he was musically, um, but in other respects, not so much. So a complex man. Yes. And you contrast that perhaps, with John Coltrane, whose music is complex, and yet as a person, he seems not quite as multidimensional. Is that fair to say? Oh, I wouldn't say that. I would say that he didn't care about whether he was wearing the latest cool looking clothes. I mean, that many people reported, in fact, he didn't always wear very nice clothes at all. Um, uh, but he had a lot of humility, whereas Miles had more of an arrogant quality to him, or c could come across that way. Um, and Coltrane was very much into spiritual stuff and trying to be a good person. Um, and that seemed to be a central mission for him. Hmm. Uh, and he surrounded himself pe with people who had that same interest, like Alice Coltrane. And then I look at him, and... Um, he brought Alice into his music, brought her into the band, and uh, wanted her to be a part of his creative life, which may have made some of his previous band members unhappy. But that's what he chose. Your favorite Miles record, your favorite Coltrane record. I'll put you on the spot here. It's hard. But I, I suppose if I have to name one album. You can name two if you'd like. OK. <laughs> Feel free. Is um, the Miles Davis, My Funny Val what was originally the My Funny Valentine album that was recorded in 1964 that has this amazing version of My Funny Valentine and S Stella by Starlight and also happened to be a benefit concert for a coalition of civil rights group for voters' rights, February 12, 1964. Mm. And it's the uh, quintet with um, uh, Wayne. Well, actually, George Coleman is on this one. Um, and Ron Carter and Tony Williams and Herbie Hancock. That's a great one. Now, of Coltrane, I like so many of them. I mean, I, like everybody else, I love, I love Supreme. But I also love Crescent. And one. I also like expression of his later ones. Hmm. It's always interesting when, you, when somebody says they love Miles or they love Coltrane. I always say, which records? Yeah. Because they have distinct periods they have distinct in their career. Periods. I mean, I also love the earlier Miles stuff. I like the earlier 1956 My Funny Valentine, the Round Midnight album. The Jazz at the Plaza album. The Sketches of Spain. Yeah, there's I a mean, I mean, an incredibly rich um, musical legacy. Well, there's a reason why these records never go out of print. Yeah. Yeah. In the time remaining, I want to ask you, as a musician, but also especially as a scholar as, and as an educator and author, how do you measure success? 
how do I measure success? I think a really feeling of success can't come completely from external stuff. It's got to become come from an internal feeling of like you're doing your best, you like how you've developed over the course of your life. Um, it's nice. I feel very fortunate that I have the external success that I've had. I couldn't believe it when I was hired at Harvard in this uh, chair and sort of the excitement about a, my work among a, an audience has surprised me. Um, and I, I, of course, have enjoyed that, but I, you know, I do feel like I've, what got me there is I've always been trying, you know, driven by trying to do the best that I can and to bring the best part of whatever skills I have to bear on this. Hmm. Dr. Ingrid Monson, continued success to you. <laughs> okay, thank you. It's been a pleasure to talk with you. Yeah, always. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.